A champion for diversity throughout a long career in telecommunications, Janet Uthman, Market Vice President for Cox Communications Las Vegas, is our guest this week on Nevada Week in Person. Support for Nevada Week in Person is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week in Person. I'm Amber Renee Dixon. Ebony Magazine named her a Power 100 executive, while Cable Facts Magazine recognized her as one of the most influential minorities in media and broadband. A longtime leader in the field of telecommunications, she's worked for Disney, Black Entertainment Television, and Comcast, now Market Vice President at Cox Communications Las Vegas. Janet Uthman, thank you for joining Nevada Week in person. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Amber. So telecommunications is the transmission of information by electronic means. And mm -hmm. in an interview that you did with Nevada Business, you said mm -hmm. it is a field that you never imagined you'd be in as long as you have. What has kept you in telecommunications? Well, let me tell you, you can have so many career paths in this industry. I started out in programming at Disney Channel and Burbank and went to Manhattan with Disney Channel and actually worked for Black Entertainment and corporate marketing. And then I came to, went to Comcast and I was heading up sales and marketing, both residential and B2B. Uh, we were rebuilding cable systems in Baltimore City. I was doing my own commercials and, and marketing. And then that led me to multicultural marketing, diversity and inclusion. And now this is kind of the sum total at Cox as market leader for Las Vegas of all the experiences I've gained over the last couple of decades. I was going to ask you this <laughs> later on, but the multicultural marketing aspect, what was the state of it back then when you entered mm -hmm. that field? Well, you know, it was interesting because I'm an analytical person by, by nature, and I looked at the demographics and the penetration of uh, folks that had Cox, uh, sorry, Comcast services, and it was a 19% point percentage point gap between multicultural and general market consumers. And that equated to about 150,000 households. And the folks that were doing all the marketing at the time were sitting in Man Manchester, New Hampshire, and they were stating that, you know, we're sending them all the same direct mail pieces. We're not sure why we're not, you know, progressing on our penetration among this group. And my answer to them was, you can't just send out general market mail pieces to this segment and expect them to come running. So for whatever reason, they thought they'd been done an injustice in the past with whether it was technical service or service by the care agents. I said, you have to establish authentic relationships with these consumers. So I'm like, we have to get from behind the desk, get out in the community. And we partnered with churches. Uh, we partnered with Panhellenic groups, which are the fraternities and the sororities who really care about you know, their community. And we had a message to get out that there's a divide out there. There's a lot of multicultural children that don't have access to broadband. So partner with us to help us get that message out. And you would be amazed at when you connect with them, some, something that's important to them in their community, they're more than willing to help. Not only that, they're more willing to consider your product and to be loyal to your product as well. But you have to get out in the community with your activations. And that digital divide is an issue here in Nevada. Uh, in Clark County, yeah. it's estimated that 150,000 residents are affected by it. And that's yeah. what that means is, is access to broadband or access to right. internet and not having it. At what point in your life did that become such a passion mm -hmm. for you? What happened that made you say, I got to tackle this? I think it was when I had the role with multicultural uh, marketing. marketing as well as in diversity and inclusion. On the diversity and inclusion side, I developed uh, the strategy for 20,000 employees in the Northeast Division while I was at Comcast because I said everyone should have an opportunity to be successful. So I think that and the multicultural marketing partnered together and that there are so many kids and seniors out there that don't have access to broadband. It really became my purpose. And when I interviewed for this role at Cox, I told them that underserved communities doing everything in my power to help close that 
digital divide. That is my purpose and my passion. So that's where it started. And you mentioned the numbers. And over the last couple of years, through, with the help of the federal government subsidy, that $30 subsidy in our Connect Assist program, which is $30, consumers who are any, on any type of government program do not have to pay anything for broadband. So we were trying to get out in the community to increase awareness for that because unfortunately too many black and brown children and families and seniors fall on the wrong side of that digital divide. For those who may not understand, not having access to the internet, how detrimental can that be? How impactful is that? Yeah, interesting you should mention it. Um, we sat down with the FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks as well as Congressman Horsford last, last week at Harry Levy Public Housing. And the commissioner wanted to hear firsthand from the residents of how um, ACP and that subsidy really helped them gain a connection to broadband. And they were stating that it's, ev it's everything. I can connect with my doctors. Sometimes my daughter can't pick me up to take me to a doctor's office, but now I can, I can access via telehealth or just um, educating themselves on the social services that are out there or their social security. So it is their connection to the world or connecting with family. I can see my grandkids now. Um, so we, what we did, our sales and marketing folks would go public housing unit by public housing unit and actually hand walk seniors through that process to get them connected. And there's another interview that I listened to. You talked about uh, being in a board meeting or mm -hmm. among your employees in that quote. Sometimes you're the only person of color. <clears throat> you may be the only woman at the table, but you have to make sure that perspective is heard because that could be the one thing that helps the business to progress. So kind of a similar question, at what yeah. point did it become obvious to you that my perspective as a person of color and as a woman mm -hmm. is not only valuable but needed for the success of a business? Absolutely, great question. So it was, I was at Disney Channel and we just had a new head of programming that came in, Rich Ross, he came from Nickelodeon and I was in New York office and he wanted to go office by office to hear the perspective of what the you know, Disney Channel's programming. So this was in the 90s at the time. And I was very frank. I said, frankly, I'm going around with these programming reels to Philadelphia, Baltimore, DC, and I'm talking to folks that look like me and they're asking me, why is the programming on Disney Channel not representative? I, you know, my kids like the, like the network, like the channel, but they don't see images of themselves. So again, this was early 90s and you didn't see a lot of diversity on the Disney Channel. And I remember talking to Rich Ross, he eventually became president of Disney Studios, uh, probably a decade later, and he said, every day I went into the office, I remembered what you told me. So I know I, I'm not by no means responsible for the wealth of diverse programming that he went on to produce, but you have to use your voice. So being the only person of color, being the only woman in some of those meetings, you have to use your voice for good. How well do you think Disney has changed its programming? Phenomenal. Yeah, They've done, he, right. I mean, he and Ann Sweeney did a phenomenal job in changing the programming, as you could tell by the, the the diversity. Vast, yeah. Oh, that's really yeah. cool. Okay. Now, long before your distinguished career in telecommunications, you were a girl growing up in upstate New York, small town, mm -hmm. I think, outside of Rochester. Right. Uh, but it was a move to San Jose, California. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. That yeah. really opened your eyes to the beauty of diversity. How so? It certainly did. So I grew up in Henrietta, New York, and you know, I was probably one of less than a handful of kids of color in my elementary school. So, you know, subjected to, you know, taunts and it's not, so I'll just say not so nice things. So it was really rough. You know, my mother would tell me, you know, you just pull, hold your head up and you pull your shoulders back and you go in there and, you know, hold your head high. Uh, so I had a strong role model, and I must say my mother grew up in the segregated South in a town called Eatonville, and there is actually a plaque in Washington, Washington D.C. at the Smithsonian African American Museum for Eatonville. It was the first all-black integrated, integrated town um, in the United States. So, she, you know, she grew up in that segregated environment. So who knew better 
you know, how to handle those challenges. But then my dad moved us all to San Jose. He was a longtime Xerox guy, got tired of shoveling snow and uh, wanted to move to California. That was his lifelong dream. And I moved to East San Jose and went to school with every nationality that you can think of. Chinese, Vietnamese, you know, Latino, Latinas. So what was, it was that like for you? It, it was like Disneyland for me <laughs> to go to school with so many folks. We, you know, we were different in so many ways, but it was, we, you know, we all wanted you know, the best things and get a great education and to do the, you know, do great by our families and in our life. So there were so many similarities, although we were so different and we all got along so well. So it was a pivotal, pivotal moment for me. And then I went to Berkeley and then seeing folks at that time, they were boycotting South Africa and companies that were, you know, selling products down there because of apartheid. So I saw students fighting for injustice. Then you had um, folks that were like, love who you love. Love is love. And you saw that all over campus. So that's really where that my whole, you know, I guess fight for justice in the underdog, that's where all of that came from. I wonder if there is any connection between that and then your time at Black Entertainment Television and being mm -hmm. part of the team yeah. that launched the first BET Awards. Yeah. What was the discussion at that yeah. time about why is this needed? Well, at that time there were mostly video, so this was going into 2000, so late 90s going into 2000, so primarily videos, and I was part of the corporate marketing team, and we, we um, hired Landor Research to do research on what African Americans wanted to see, and they want to see what everyone wants to see, lifestyle programming, um, news programming, awards where we're celebrating our, our people, um, movies that reflect images of ourselves. So I remember we all sat around and we presented the information to Bob Johnson at the time, and out of that came Arabesque Films. It's no longer in existence, but a couple of things. 106 and Park was a lifestyle show that lasted, for, I think, for close to 20 years, and then the BET Awards. It was the first ever uh, BET Awards, and I think it's still the highest rated show on the network today. So it was amazing to be a part of that team and to uh, you know, have access to Bob jo Johnson, who was a visionary of his time. What kind of impact do you think those awards have had? Just a celebration and pride for African Americans, because I think you could probably count on a couple of hands the number of African Americans that were celebrated as part of MTV awards at that time. So really, it, you know, it was pride and something that we owned. We could talk career, career, career with you, but I want to yeah. make sure we fit this in. The reason you came to Southern Nevada was personal, right? right. What was Ab it? Absolutely. So I will tell you, uh, when I started the interview with Cox, 16 interviews, um, I was actually interviewing to go to Southern California. I was going to have my role, market leader for Orange County. And um, at the time they found out my father was ill. He fell ill while I was in the interview process. And the leader of California and the head of operations, they were like, where are you? And I was like, well, I'm in Nevada because my father fell ill. Um, and they're like, how are your parents doing? And I said, you know, it's been a tough week. I said, but I pray all will be well. We're and that 30 seconds left. So. And, and that night they called me and they said, we're going to do everything in our power to get you to Nevada because that market leader role is open. So oh. I'll be eternally grateful. To Can you Cox. quickly summarize the impact your parents have had on you? Uh, everything. My dad's one of the first black engineers at Xerox. Uh, my mother went on to work in Silicon Valley at National Semiconductor. So just, just everything. amazing, brilliant. Look at the parents. woman that they made. <laughs> Janet Uthman, thank you so much for joining Nevada Week in person. My pleasure.